Good afternoon, Rosemary. How are you doing? Hi, Shannon. Good to see you. You too. Um, I'm really excited to be on this Zoom call this afternoon with yourself and Jim Steely as well to talk about the historic context and the history of uh, the University Park neighborhood. So first I wanted to briefly introduce myself uh, so anyone who's watching this video today will understand why we're here. So I'm the preservation coordinator with Historic Denver. We're a preservation nonprofit in the city of Denver. And we have a lot of programs, including owning and operating the Molly Brown House Museum. But one of the programs that I manage is the Action Fund program. And that is how we got connected up with University Park neighbors and Rosemary for this specific project of the historic context and researching the history and identifying significant buildings in the neighborhood. So I wanted to give uh, Rosemary a quick second to introduce herself and her role in the neighborhood. I'm Rosemary Stoffel, and I've been on the neighborhood board for probably more than 10 years. Um, I was also on the board of Historic Denver, but in my own neighborhood, um, I've lived here for a long time, and I've been concerned for many, many years about the loss of our houses. So I will, I will talk about this more later, but that's why I'm here, to see Historic Denver as an opportunity to help us. So. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And Historic Denver was very excited to partner with the University Park neighborhood on this project of a historic context. And as I mentioned, identifying significant buildings in the neighborhood. Um, because this neighborhood and its, uh, its specific history is very important to the overall history of Denver. And there are not many Denver landmarks in the neighborhood that really tell the story of the development of Univers University Park in the neighborhood. So I look forward to talking with you, Rosemary, this afternoon uh, to learn a little bit more about um, the project and before delving into the actual research that was found by the consultant Square Moon. And we have Jim Steely here today uh, to give the presentation that the Square Moon consultants found on all the research. So Rosemary, why did your neighborhood want to do this project and ultimately reach out to Historic Denver and apply for the Action Fund? You know, our neighborhood has lost so many older homes in recent years, and it seemed to reach a tipping point when two really important houses were demolished within months of each other. Mm -hmm. We gathered a group of residents who had all expressed their concern, and we formed the Community Preservation Committee. We saw the Action Fund as a great way to help us hold on to our history. We wanted a professionally researched history to be able to tell our residents the story of our neighborhood, our origins, who the major players were, and why our architecture is so diverse. We wanted to get the message across loud and clear about why these older homes are important to our history and to our sense of place. We also wanted tools to help us keep as many of our most important homes as possible. We were thrilled when Historic Denver accepted our application. Well, thank you, Rosemary. And what has the neighborhood done since receiving the Action Fund funding, such as raising awareness or community gatherings? Um, early on, we held a neighborhood information gathering day with the consultants who really took charge of it and did a fantastic job. Um, residents brought in photos, information about their houses, and stories about the neighborhood. We've also given updates on the project and tidbits about our history in every issue of our newsletter. And one of our residents has even put together kids walking tour, a map highlighting some of our very most important homes. We started working with a graduate student in historic preservation who, will, who is helping put together story maps about our history, which will be able to be accessed via anyone's cell phone. That's really exciting. And I know a lot of work has gone in over the last couple of years, uh, working with the consultants, working with neighbors and getting the information all piled together that uh, Jim Steely will present to us today. And, during this crazy time, we wish we could have had this as a in-person live presentation at a community meeting, but we are figuring a way around it and are excited to be able to present this information to the community through a virtual format. 
So we will uh, let Jim Seeley from Square Moons Consulting, uh, we'll turn it over to you, Jim, to be able to provide that presentation about all the history that has been collected during this research project. And first, if you want to introduce yourself before starting, um, but I know at here in just a second, you will share your screen so we can go ahead and dive into that presentation after you kind of give us a little introduction. Okay. Uh, thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Rosemary, very much. I'm Jim Steely, an architectural historian and principal at Square Moon Consultants, and I'm here to give you an overview of this history project that Rosemary has been describing that we finished uh, on University Park neighborhood. It includes three components that you see on the screen, uh, historic context, an architectural style guide, and a preservation priority recommendations. First, let's talk about historic context. A historic context is really just the history of the neighborhood defined by a theme, place, and time. The theme is University Park, Utop Utopian Colony, and Suburb on the South Denver Plains. The place is the current University Park neighborhood boundaries, which are South University on the west, I-70 on the north, South Colorado Boulevard on the east, and Yale for Avenue for most of the South boundary. The time, and by the way, time is also a period of significance, quote unquote, in landmark applications, begins in 1885 with the first subdivision, which was University Gardens, and ends in 1969 when the whole current neighborhood essentially built out. These names should be familiar to all of you. They are major avenue names in the neighborhood. John Evans was the early 1860s governor of Colorado. He has a very well-deserved negative association with the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864, but he was also a complex character and was definitely a mover and shaker when it came to University Park, including the founding of the Denver and New Orleans Railroad that ran through the neighborhood. He helped establish Northwestern University in the town of Evanston, Illinois, then wanted uh, to repeat all that success in Denver starting in downtown Denver in 1864 with the Methodist affiliated Colorado Seminary that provided secular education, but also struggled to stay open in its first years. Colorado statehood in 1876 improved the economy and that school's prospects. Elizabeth Eiliff Warren was widowed by John Wesley Eiliff in 1878 and inherited his considerable land and cattle holdings and was a devout Methodist. Henry White Warren traveled to Colorado on several church-related trips, met Lizzie, and they married in 1883 as the Methodist Church created a bishop position for him in Denver. He soon promoted a school of theology associated with Colorado Seminary, and Lizzie then pledged money to make that happen. But she wanted the location, quote, away from the distractions, noise, and smoke of downtown Denver, unquote. Henry Bucktell, on the right, first moved to Colorado in 1886 and became minister of the downtown Denver Methodist Church, raising funds to complete the new Trinity Methodist Episcopal Church uh, building that's still at Broadway in 18. The Univers University Park founders' best land offer to Elizabeth's offer and the, the uh, seeking to get away from the city was an 80 acre prairie hilltop from potato farmer Rufus Clark, approximately six miles southeast of central Denver, which at that time had a population of 35,000. Clark, a reformed drinker, conveyed the land for $10,500, which had to be paid if the Colorado Seminary, now also called University of Denver, did not subdivide and sell lots plant 1,000 trees, or construct academic buildings within two years. The colony now had a home for DU and its dedicated religious program. DU raised money and purchased 320 additional acres east of uh, Clark's 80 acres for their residential colony and laid it out using Methodist leaders names, Wesley, Asbury, and others, for some avenues. DU promised, quote, where the dominant and controlling ideas shall be conscience and culture, unquote, 
and shall be possible in a, quote, supremely healthy location, unquote. DU then started selling lots to local Methodists. Notice that Evans Railroad ran through the plant in the uh, upper area. He personally sold lots, and to buy one or more, one had to apply for membership in the colony, and you were only accepted if you could commence improvements within 60 days. Deed restrictions ensured temperance, meaning no alcohol consumption or a host of other vices. The Colorado Seminary, now DU, sold lots beginning in 1886. Two went for $300, and most lots uh, were and still are 25 by 150 feet. So if you bought two lots, you had 7,500 square feet to develop your house within 60 days. Coincidentally to all of this, in 1886, the town of South Denver formed and University Park was happy to join. All were on the same page with restrictive covenants, pro-temperance stands, and hoping that this would bring infrastructure, particularly water service, to the area. The Denver Circle Railroad extended into the neighborhood from South Denver in 1887, offering commuter rail service to central Denver four times a day this was followed four years later by an electric streetcar line along Evans Avenue in 1891. The colony began planting those trees, laid out three parks, including Observatory Park, the only one that actually became a park. But this location was a stretch. It was so far from amenities, water, transportation, and others, that it struggled to take root and grow. Elizabeth Warren, to back up her offer, in 1887 purchased four lots and built a large two-story home on the northeast corner of Milwaukee and Warren, which she called Gray Gables. There in the historic photograph and their same position today, sorry, historic photo position today. Uh, she then went on to build the house next door the same year. However, both sat vacant for two years because of the lack of water throughout the colony. Even deep wells yielded no water under this part of the prairie. Then South Denver extended a water line into the neighborhood and Bishop Warren built a third house here near Lizzie's in 1890. This became Professor's Row. Look at all these trees and that's the Evans store in the far left background at the end of Professor's Row across the street. In 1888, John Evans built that store. He commissioned the two-story brick commercial building at 2084 South Milwaukee on the northeast corner of Evans and Milwaukee. It housed a general store, the post office, the trolley ticket office, and Warren's private office, and it held the first local Methodist religious services upstairs. Real estate investor, and too soon a big time real estate loser, Humphrey Chamberlain donated money for the building and telescope of Chamberlain Observatory. Professor Herbert Howe, a DU instructor in math, astronomy, survey, and other courses, and trained in astronomy in Chicago, chose well-known Denver architect Robert Rushlob to design the observatory, built between 1889 and 1894, and to design Professor Herbert and his wife Fanny's house in 1891. The observatory still there, an observatory park, and that's the student observatory next to it, and a short boardwalk away for Professor Howe, his house that the same architect designed for him and Fanny. Landscape architect Rudolf Ulrich, a German by way of California, in 1890 laid out a formal plan for the DU campus in University Park. This often reproduced map here is the drawing he created. Ulrich included the three hopeful parks with the observatory park in the middle. His plan focused DU and the colony on the intersection of Warren and University here. The first two campus buildings, University Hall at the top, pictured at top, opened in 1892 and Isleth Hall, the dedicated building for a theology program, opened in 1893 with $50,000 in, in donation from Will Isleth, Lizzie, Lizzie Warren's stepson. The Warrens' big bet on University Park came in 1893 with construction of their Fitzroy Place, a block-sized complex. It is still the largest residence in the neighborhood. The same architects, New York's Fuller and Wheeler, designed the Isle of Hall Seminary School. 
Lizzie's daughter, Louise, lived here until 1966. Today, this is well-preserved as the home of accelerated schools. While the colony and DU accomplished much and passed many construction milestones, relatively few lots were developed and then the Panic of 1893 became part of a worldwide depression that dramatically slowed down all of Uni University Park's progress. Largely as a result, the colony and South Denver joined the city of Denver in 1894 with a vote of 288 to 100. Unfortunately, it would still take Denver another 15 years to solve University Park's water problems. At the end of this first study period, much activity was only land speculation, early subdivisions that bet on a successful DU and colony, but little actual development. Only a spattering of homes, mostly in University Park subdivision proper, those are the red dots uh, clustered around the center, uh, show up on the filed subdivisions of the neighborhood by 1894. So the subdivisions filed, but very little activity, with very, very little to no activity within most of them. In our next time period, during, the, during that 1890s depression, DU attendance fell from about 850 to fewer than 300 between 1892 and 1894. DU stopped selling lots and hunkered down. Others in the community who overinvested in real estate and who were counting on land sales went bust. John Babcock, for example, platted his university gardens in 1885, plat shown here, anticipating that University Park would expand to the south, bought land, subdivided, built a big home, which is still there on the right, and donated money for the community's first school, in 18, built in 1893, the black and white photograph. In the 1890s, he and wife Maggie lost everything and both became janitors at this school, living in its basement. Streetcar service went during this depression from two lines to zero by 1898. Then in 1899, Will Eilif and compadres brought in a new streetcar line that remained in service for 51 years until 1950. While Will was living on Professor's Row in one of his mother-in-law's homes, that was Lizzie Warren, he married Alberta Bloom in 1897 and they built their home, Ormley, at 2145 South Adams in 1899, one of the few pieces of good news in this period. In the next time period, the turn of the century, University Park was in a quandary. DU and others owned all this land for the colony, but DU was $200,000 in debt. That's about $6 million in 2020 dollars. The Isla School of Theology had closed completely in 1900. It spun off as independent from DU in 1903 and then reopened in 1910. Henry Bucktail came back to Denver and to DU in 1900 as DU's life-saving chancellor but, and built his home in 1906, then became governor uh, of Colorado the next year and his home became the de facto governor's mansion. That put University Park on the map. And as part of the recovery, DU started selling lots again. In 1903, DU engaged a realty company to begin selling lots, and in 1910, DU incorporated its own university land and building company to oversee land sales and development. The colony concept was by now replaced with a need to embrace the new century by lot sales to anyone, but still with deed restrictions in place. 36 building permits were issued for the neighborhood between 1906 and 1914, when essentially World War I again cut off development. Water improvements finally came with the Denver Water Pump Station in 1911 at South University and South Jewel. In 1916, DU's enrollment was up with 1,695 enrolled on both the downtown and hilltop campuses. The hilltop campus started filling in with new buildings. The 1909 library, the 1912 science hall, the 1917 chapel, uh, of which a, a tower still survives, and did um, I mention the gymnasium, the 1910 gymnasium, all on the east side, on uh, the west side of South University, on the east side of South University, shown on the top right of this early 
1920s aerial photograph, the neighborhood began filling in at last. New homes started filling in throughout the neighborhood, some by U DU professors and others associated with DU, and many other lots were bought by middle and upper class Denverites attracted to the neighborhood's suburban appeal and large lots. Clockwise from upper left, 3109 East Warren, was the home to Edward Milligan, an executive with Kistler Stationer Company in Denver, and his wife, Ella Metzger Milligan, DU's first Dean of Women. 2075 uh, South Columbine was built as a parsonage for University Park Methodist Episcopal Church before they had a church. Uh, 2011 South Clayton is one of the many homes built by um, middle-class Denverites, such as broom makers, office workers, shopkeepers. 2288 South Milwaukee was associated with Dr. Edward Jackson, an ophthalmologist who popularized the use of the retinoscope. And 2112 South Columbine is an early bungalow built for Dr. Frank Hunt Hurd Roberts, a history and government educator who joined the DU faculty in 1903. This map shows homes built in the neighborhood from 1895 to 1920. The red dots are the handful built between uh, the mid-90s and 1900. The green dots are the next 20 years from 1900 to 1920. A few more homes appeared outside the original University Park subdivision in neighboring plants to the south, such as Iliff's Edition, a subdivision formed by Will Iliff with business partners. Not very many others, though, appeared outside of that core. In the next time period, by 1920, Denver's population was more than 250,000 and had nearly doubled from 1900. The largest growth areas for Greater Denver in the ensuing two decades were those that were farther out along streetcar lines. University Park saw much growth as a result of Denver's overall economic boom. Most homes built in the University Park during this period were 1,000 to 1,500 square feet in size, contrasting with the larger two-story homes of prior periods. Some of these smaller homes were architect design and, and showed a high level of detail, such as the 1922 home on the upper right, uh, which was designed by local architect William Bowman. On the lower right is 2261 South St. Paul from 1925, and in the middle is a 1922 bungalow. Denver's first zoning code in 1925 indicated where apartments and commercial buildings could go, calling out the corner of Evans and Josephine near the DU campus, where University Park's first apartment building cluster was built during the late 1920s and 1930s. Landscape architect Sacco de Boer presented his 1923 plan, which built on the 1890 Ulrich plan for the neighborhood. He strongly complimented the neighborhood for planting many trees to turn a, quote, bleak, windswept dry, windswept, dry ridge into a finely shaded suburb, unquote. And he called for more tree plantings in significant detail. He addressed the neighborhood's isolation from central Denver, encouraging a boulevard along the still functioning rail line up here to the northeast. And he also addressed the flooding problems to the south by drawing a parkway along the slough, much later improved as Harvard Gulch. Henry Bucktell's death the next year, 1924, set in motion DeBoer's vision for that boulevard conversion of a portion of the Colorado Southern Railroad's right-of-way, with DU donating an additional 100-foot wide strip of land on the south side of the railroad for a new boulevard to be named Bucktail in honor of the former DU chancellor and governor. The boulevard was built in several phases beginning in 1927. This Denver Post photograph showed the dedication ceremony for a 1930s segment of the boulevard northwest of DU, here where the tracks continued to run between the traffic lanes. Many more homes were built in this period than in prior time periods. Blue dots, the, the blue dots show homes built between 1921 and 1937. 
Many homes were in the original University Park subdivision, but more homes started appearing in other parts of the neighborhood as well. The neighborhood is starting to build out or move out. In the next time period, the Federal Housing Administration, beginning in 1934, lowered down payment requirements for mortgages and created design standards for homes, including the FHA quote unquote minimum house that started at about 550 square feet and included two bedrooms and one bathroom. This resulted in one story starter homes appearing on empty lots throughout the neighborhood, but particularly on the north and southern edges in the late 1930s and 40s. The University Park Lumber Company on the northwest corner of the current neighborhood created its own catalog of homes that could build to meet FHA standards. One such example was the Oregon model still standing on South Madison. The Valley Highway, now Interstate 25, was planned during World War II and they began uh, right-of-way purchases in 1944. It was completed past University Park 10 years later in 1954. A few homes on the northern edge of the neighborhood were torn down to make way for the, for the freeway, but empty lots here and elsewhere continued to fill in. On the right, the Arapahoe Building Company resubdivided in land in University Gardens to create Arapahoe Gardens and built cookie cutter ranch homes such as this 1949 house at South Monroe, just north of Harvard Avenue. Other infill homes consisted of one-off custom homes, such as the very interesting 1946 modern house at 2200 East Monroe, built for George Vito, a local nightclub owner. One of the last big purchases of neighborhood land from DU occurred in 1937, when Florence Martin acquired three whole blocks of land from DU in the northeast part of University Park. The land eventually came into the hands of developer Bill Hewson and partners who resubdivided the land as Park Villa. Hewson built the Park Villa condominiums, an early, if not the first condominium residential complex in Denver, completed in 1961. The complex came under a center, uh, came with a center courtyard, pool, cabana, and enclosed garage spaces, unusual for Denver at the time. Houston also built single family homes, one story ranch homes and two story revival store style homes elsewhere in the subdivision. In the 1960s, much of DeBoer's 1923 plan was finally realized. Harvard Gulch was tamed by 1967, channelized and parts were made into city parks. The 1950s and 60s were Denver's top, Denver's top two decades for new construction and University Park was no exception. The neighborhood was practically filled in by 1969 with very few vacant lots available for development after that date. Our final map demonstrates uh, all the construction that had occurred in the neighborhood between 1938 and 1969. So uh, during at the end of the depression and through World War II and all through the 50s and 60s and the filling in of empty lots throughout uh, today's University Park neighborhood quite impressive and it explains much of the neighborhood's um, appearance today. The second section of our effort um, relates to the architectural trends and styles of the neighborhood. The neighborhood built out over several long periods from 1886 to 1969, more than 80 years. So as architectural styles and trends changed in the US and in Denver, they also changed in University Park. Early owners were not afraid to experiment, and in some cases, University Park was on the cutting edge of national architectural trends for housing. We highlighted some of the most important and prevailing styles that you see in the neighborhood today and pointed out some of the defining characteristics to help you understand what style is your home or is your neighbor's. Also, we discussed other distinctive physical characteristics of the neighborhood, such as large lots, a leftover from the more rural origins of the University Park colony, mature vegetation, and all that started with the tree plantings by DU in 1886 to meet Rufus Clark's requirements, and wide tree lawns with sidewalks, as you see here with the Will in Alberta Iliff House from 1899 Ormley at 2245 South Adams. The Romanesque revival is um, not uh, frequent in the neighborhood, but there are some great examples. Uh, they have masonry walls, typically with rough face stone, uh, the round arch appears several places, if not only in one uh, central location on the building. Deep 
creating deep cavernous entryways and window openings. Over at DU, both Iliff and University Halls were influenced by this Romanesque style. The Queen Anne style uh, is more prevalent in the earliest um, development of the neighborhood, usually brick houses with complex roofs, decorated wall surfaces and gable ends, one-story porches often wraparound, and lots of wood ornamentation. There's a transitional uh, period in University Park between the Queen Anne to the Four Square. On the left are two homes designed by Robert Rushlob, a prominent Denver architect. 2142 South Milwaukee at the top left, still partly wood shingled, but in a simpler, much simpler shape. At the bottom left, Herbert and Fanny Howe's house from 1891 at 2201 South Fillmore. It's boxier, all brick, but it still has a wraparound porch. Still very modern for the time with much less ornamentation than frills. Another local architect, Frank Grotevent, designed the home on the right for Mrs. Augusta Trott, a widow with several children in 1895. His design, this design, was featured in Carpentry and Building Magazine, the first time a four square house was featured in any major publication in all of the United States. At 2181 South Columbine, it is totally square with the porch only on the front and very little ornamentation. It was very influential for just not just University Park, but all of Denver. Four squares became popular uh, throughout the neighborhood and the city and also spawned a one-story version, which in Colorado is called a classic cottage. Uh, so the uh, four square is usually two-story. The classic cottage is one story, but they each have four main rooms on each floor. They have low hipped roofs with central front dormers. They have deep overhanging roof eaves, flat, flat relatively unadorned facades, and one-story porches, typical for University Park off-center, not centered on, uh, directly under that dormer. Early bungalows after the turn of the century uh, have, are, are well represented in University Park, have some great examples here. The Roberts House at the top of here photo is from 1906 um, by the same architect, Harlan Thomas, along with the Bucktail Bungalow of 1906 on the bottom right. Both of these were featured in the Craftsman Magazine, which was the uh, voice of the arts and crafts movement in the United States. That was a big deal. Lots and lots of other bungalows appear in the neighborhood. They're typically one to one and a half stories and they're typically brick with low slung, low slung roofs, deep eaves, exposed rafter ends, front big wide front porches, blocky brick porch columns that often are slanted to the top and many um, wood features like brackets and wood brace, uh, knee braces, false half timbering and other stick work. The colonial revival appears throughout the neighborhood, uh, made very popular after the Chicago exposition of the 1890s highlighted this style of architecture. On the upper right is the 1907 Georgian Revival House at 2187 South Adams, built by Robert Beggs, a principal of Whittier School and a DU trustee. And below is a more modest 1926 example at 2265 South Clayton. The Tudor Revival, very popular in the neighborhood and throughout Denver, um, based on the, the original Tudor style from England, the example at the top is a 1929 Tudor revival, uh, said to be an expansion of a farmhouse there by architect Gordon White at 2300 South Monroe, and below one of the many uh, modest Tudor revival homes, this one from 1937. The Gothic revival is not, uh, again, like uh, Romanesque everywhere in the neighborhood, but there's some great examples. And the best examples are from 1928 to 1950 as the collegiate Gothic version. These are masonry buildings. Um, the masonry continues all the way up into the gables. Extensive use of pointed arches and as shallow as they are, they're still pointed. Crenellated parapets are reminiscent of medieval castles and uh, other embellishments of stone or really terracotta carvings are around the doors, windows and at entries. 
Modernism appeared early, uh, relatively, in University Park. Um, and here we showed it occurring off and on between 1932 and 1969. Modernism began by the clients and the designers searching for simplicity, practicality, and a lack of applied style. The examples here are the Eugene Groves House of 1932, cast concrete with a low domed roof, and the house below is a 1952 example that uses irregular window patterns to bring light into the modest, undecorated building. The ranch style is an extension of modernism and occurred throughout the neighborhood between 1940 and 1969. We've already talked about minimal traditional as a popular type here, but the ranch house, more stretched out, was often on larger lots, sometimes with Western ranch characteristics, including prominent rail fencing in the yard. The third section of the study looks at what is historically important and unique in terms of this neighborhood and lays out priorities for protecting and preserving that heritage. We created a hierarchy of importance, one plus, one, and two, which I'll explain here. The one plus priority includes, for example, 1887 Gray Gables that we've talked about at 2184 South Milwaukee. Uh, this is an early Victorian era Queen Anne house in University Park on Professor's Row, built by Elizabeth Warren, one of the early promoters of University Park. Henry and Elizabeth Warren moved into the house in 1889. Eventually, it was the home of chancellors, professors, fraternities, and guests. It's featured in many early historic photographs and articles on University Park. That's an example of a one plus priority to designate as Denver Landmark. We also recommended a one plus district, which happens to include Gray Gables, which is right here, but also includes a sampling of homes from all periods of University Park development facing the park and on connecting streets. As the one preservation priority, we have an example here of uh, 2140 South Clayton. This was reportedly built as a rental house by DU 1891 is very early for the neighborhood. It's significant and, in, and intact as an example of the Queen Anne style. Several people lived here, including DU professors and Denver merchants, an example of a one priority for a landmark designation. And an example of the two priority, um, these are typically good architectural examples, certainly worth preserving, but they need more research to become Denver landmarks. Many could be part of a historic district, but one recommended at East Evans and South Josephine for, uh, and one is recommended uh, for an apartment neighborhood at East uh, Evans and South Josephine. That's the end of our three parts and presentation. So we're wishing you all luck with preservation priorities, and we want to thank you for the opportunity of getting to know the neighborhood and working with all of you. Thank you so much, Jim, for giving that great presentation and all of that thorough research. It was definitely a uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, document that was prepared by uh, the Square Moon consultants for the neighborhood. And I know that Rosemary had a few closing remarks that she wanted to bring up, or if there was anything, any other thoughts that you had, I'll let you take it away, Rosemary. Well, I think. It, it's just an amazing piece of work. And I, I wanted to, I don't know if you can see this on screen. This is the actual document. It's thick. It contains the three different components. It's a historic context. It's basically the, the history story. And then um, the architectural style book, which you can take around the neighborhood and look at different architectural styles. And then the um, preservation priorities, which is, going to be our roadmap for how we're going to proceed with trying to save as much left as we can. So um, I just wanted to make everybody aware that this is currently available on loan. Um, we're talking about turning it into an actual book that we'll be able to sell perhaps as a fundraiser. So that's kind of on our radar screen. But I just wanted to emphasize that we consider this an absolute treasure trove of information. 
we have, even those of us who have lived in the neighborhood for a long time, we walk around with this information and we say, we never knew. We never knew. We never knew these stories. So some people like the history. Um, some people like the gossipy parts of the history. Some people are much more interested in the architectural styles. And some people, it's like, what are our most important houses? So it serves a lot of different purposes. So um, right now what we're doing is we're developing ideas for story map walking tours. And we're talking about perhaps using yard signs to demonstrate the different architectural styles. Um, we're hoping to eventually, eventually lead in-person walking tours through the neighborhood. Um, we'll, we'll continue to include the information in our newsletter. Um, we see every step as a way of getting the message across to everybody in our neighborhood that we have an amazing history. It is unique and we need to make efforts now to save as much as we can. Um, we'll be using the information as a roadmap, which we've never had before put together by professional experts to help us save as much as we can. Um, we'll be talking to individual homeowners about the significance of their houses. Um, I think Probably in the future, this document will continue to be used in ways that we haven't even thought about yet. So it was well worth the effort. It was well worth, hopefully, historic Denver feels it was well worth the effort. And we're thrilled with the result. And we'll absolutely be using it in a multitude of ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And yes, Historic Denver has definitely been very excited throughout the process to work with the consultants as well as Rosemary and the neighbors that were very heavily involved in this action fund project. And it's really exciting to see the final outcome and be able to share it with the community or even neighbors outside of the University Park neighborhood that wants to learn more about the different areas of Denver and all of the history that we have that's so special to our city. So Hopefully this video gets out there to all the neighbors around University Park is the, one of the first steps to kind of spread the word about this great information. So thank you both Rosemary and Jim for joining us this afternoon to provide this presentation and be able to share so much of this information to the neighbors. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Jim. Thank you. And I'm sure with this video, there will be some contact information as well for Rosemary as a part of the University Park Neighborhood Association. Uh, but it, if you want to learn more, you know, I think there will also be links on the University Park Neighborhood Association website as well. Yes, we'll be posting it on our website and there will be a link that I can send out to people so they can access it in, in various ways. Great. Well, thank, thank you, you both. Have a good rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you all. Take care. Thank you.